Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, now with a different perspective on the same topic, religious tolerance and inclusiveness, is the contribution of Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, a religious cleric of repute, an author of distinction, an irrepressible social critic, and an unrepentant advocate of social justice, equity, and a better society at home and worldwide. Matthew Hassan Kuka served as a member of Nigeria's Truth Commission, Secretary of the Catholic Bishops' Conference, member of Nigeria Electoral Reform Committee, and also a member of the National Peace Committee. A Kennedy School of Government master's degree holder in public policy, he also holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Matthew Hassan Kuka is currently the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I invite my Lord Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka. Your Excellencies, Mr. President and the Vice President and uh, our brother, friend, the former President of uh, Kenya, other distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure that many of you may already be nervous as to what Bishop Kuka is going to say. <laughs> I feel like Miriam Makeba, the late Miriam Makeba. She said that every time I stand up to speak, and they will say, here comes the troublemaker. But uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, I really want to thank you. I mean, your most eloquent speech struck a chord. And had I received a copy of your speech earlier, I think that even that alone should have broadened the scope of our conversation. As you can see, the Sultan and I are different. He's taller than me. He has a much more regal appearance. Uh, and he's spoken to you about the caliphate and its wonderful values. I'm a citizen of Nigeria living in Sokoto, but I'll come from a slightly different perspective, from the point of view of constitutionalism and constitutional governance and how all this fit into religion. Because I think the temptation for many of us is to assume that somehow religion is a problem. Um, and I think the, 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 press, the former president's uh, speech made the point very clear that religion, just like any other form of identity, whether it's ethnicity, religion, gender, the real problem is when these categories are left unattended to. It is then that they provoke problems. So I, I, I really think that we must appreciate the fact that all the values and the temptations, the trials that the people of Kenya have gone through. In summary, what struck me very powerfully was the idea of the tyranny of numbers, the tyranny of victory. And if I may add, the, the arrogance and the triumphalism that tends to characterize victory and how dangerous all these are. Because numbers are important, but they're only important up to a point. And the real challenge is what you do and how you aggregate these numbers for national development. And I think Nigeria and Africa in general must wake up to the threat that is posed by the emergence of what you call illiberal democracy. 20 years ago, this word was not talked about, but now it is in the vocabulary of political science. That there is a resurgence of democracies that look like democracies, but don't work like democracies. They conduct elections, they have judiciary, they have political parties, but in the final analysis, they are a halfway house between the values of democracy and dictatorship and tyranny. And I think that the, the, the guest speaker has given us all the ingredients we require to be able to walk through the challenges. And I saw the vice president-elect smiling. He's somebody I already know. And uh, I appreciate the depth of his intellect and his capacity to process a lot of the issues that are on the table. There are many people, including Christians, who will be disappointed that Bishop Kuka is standing here because there's been a lot of has been made out of the fact that we are dealing with a Muslim-Muslim 
uh, set of people who have won the elections, what are the implications of this for Nigeria? And of course, with one side of our mouth, we also say as Nigerians that we want people to be able to govern us, who love us, who cherish us, and who understand the principles of the management of diversity. Now, we will not be nervous, and we really should not be nervous about the future. Not only because it is in the hands of God, but I think that the greatest value, and I hope that this lecture that has been delivered by Uhuru Kenyatta, although unfortunately, sir, you've been in Nigeria twice, but we are not yet Uhuru. We are still, we are aspiring. We're not yet Uhuru yet. But I hope that it provides the incoming government with the texture, the material that it requires. Because how to build a good society is not a complicated thing. It is not a complicated thing. And the principles and the question, because one of the things that SGF said to me was also the fact that we'll be talking about the fact that as Nigerians, we are better together. Everybody knows that we are better together. But the first question to ask is, who are we? After 9-11, the American political scientists were asking the question, who are we? Because there was a problem in terms of who people are. And I think if you live in Nigeria, all of us know. And this is why those who listen to me will attest to the fact that I don't like to talk about religion, in part because I don't believe there is a religious problem. But somehow, the Western media, the Nigerian media, and the political elite have assumed the fact that there is something between religions, and that there is a conflict between religions. There is absolutely no conflict you know, between religions. I say to people, assuming, for example, we all have knives in our houses. Assuming you come back from work and your wife is in the kitchen, and uh, she comes to welcome you with a knife in her back with which she's been slicing onions. You will have no problem entering the house. But if you had a fight with your wife before you left the house, and she, he, your husband comes back and knocks on the door, and you see your wife with a knife, you will pull back. So knives by themselves are not a problem. It's what you do with them. In the same way that, you know, identities are not, identities are not a problem. Identities are not a problem. It's how you activate those identities and what you do with them. Now, will I be walking around Nigeria and people say to me, we worry about you being in Sokoto, you know. And, you know, when I speak, I can tell a million stories. And I give you an example, what happened in Sokoto. When, with the tragic story of Deborah, I was here, I was, I had gone for a burial of the father of one of my priests and I was on, the, on, on my way back in a car when I got a call to say that one of my priests called me to say, look, this is what is happening. And I, I got to Abuja and I got telephone calls from everywhere. Where are you? I said, I'm in Abuja. He said, I, I hope you remain in Abuja. I hope you're not going back to Sokoto anytime soon. You know, my family members who called me, every, I said, so what am I supposed to do? No, remain in Abuja. Some people say, leave the country. And I said, to go where? And People could not understand. When I had to go back to Sokoto the next day, people said to me, I mean, I had to just tell my friend, where are you? I, I told them I'm in Abuja. But when I got to Sokoto, I walked to my house. And uh, for me, it's, it's a very powerful image. As I entered my house, just as I got to the gate, I saw an armored tank, soldiers, their numbers, guarding my house. And I was touched. I came out of the vehicle and I greeted all the soldiers. I shook all of them. But I saw from their faces, they looked to me very much like Fulani people, the soldiers who were guarding my house. By their height and so on. So when I went in, then later in the evening, I came back and I started talking to them. There were about 12 or 14 of them. I, first of all, I looked at them, with all their equipment that they are in my house. After we greeted, I went back at about 6.30 to 7, I came out, stood by my balcony, and I saw all of them <laughs> doing their ablution, they are preparing for their salah, and they, they prayed in my house. I'm looking at them, and this is, this is Sokoto I'm supposed to be running away from. And here are these people, they are Muslims, they are Nigerians, they are here to protect me. Nigeria is a complex country of great possibilities, great contradictions, about which we will not be in this crisis. Managing diversity is a science. The World Bank knows this. My brother, Dr. Akunyumi, is here. He's going, he's going to talk about all this. 
They understand and no country, no business, no family, no organization has a future if you don't figure out how to manage diversity. I want to conclude by saying religion has been turned into a weapon and it's a weapon of choice for politics and politicians. The danger and the challenge for us as religious leaders because the Conservative Party in England, because the British government was a theocratic state, so to say, and the Conservative Party was literally part of the Anglican Church. And the joke used to be that the Anglican Church is the Conservative Party at prayer. The danger with being captured by politicians is that religious leaders, and I tell people, I, 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 when people talk about Ashwaju Bola, Tinibu, Atiku, Peter Obi, and all of this, <laughs> I work with the vice president-elect, I served for, eight, for six years or so in Atiku's university. Uh, Peter Obi is my very close friend of very many years. Uh, and I'm like, I'm a Nigerian, and I can work with anybody. And we must get to that point in which we have a lot of trust in ourselves. So religion in Nigeria, the section 10 of the constitution talks about the fact that no, no, the state should not adopt religion as a state religion. But we know that the reality is completely different. So the challenge for us going forward is to address the issue. What is the point, the meeting point between religion and politics? For us as Christians and as Muslims, we must understand we are first of all citizens of the Federal Republic of Nigeria who just happen to be Christians or Muslims. We could be anything else. And our inability to appreciate those differences also is directly related to the way the political class has continued to treat us. Let me put it that way. Because if you are not able to manage diversity well, people have gotten out their pens and their pencils. When you call out ministers, everybody is looking at who is from my village, who is from my town. Because, no thanks, we have come to associate opportunity, privilege, with having your own person in power. It's not the way to go, but the reality has led us otherwise. So I want to say that first of all, Nigeria must heal. Nigeria must heal. But we also must have the courage to identify the scars, the wounds, the injuries. The worst thing that can happen to us is to pretend that everything is okay because everything is not okay. We have so many of our citizens who have lost their lives we have so many of our citizens who are still in captivity. Managing diversity and managing differences is not about religious leaders talking together. It is about whether the state can create the kind of infrastructure, the guardrails that can help Nigerians move as citizens of their country. But right now, there is how people feel because they are Christians or Muslims. There is how people feel because they are women. The, the levels and categories of, inclus of, of exclusion are so tremendous and so immense. So I hope that going forward, the things that the guest speaker has spoken about most eloquently, that is, how do you manage victory? How do you manage victory? How do you mutate from being a politician who was contesting election to being a politician who has won elections? Very often, very often, and what is clear to us in Africa, why religion, why ethnicity, why all these things continue to injure our, country, our countries, is largely because we have not come to terms with the fact that power is just about, as somebody said, our turn to eat. Michaela Rong's book, I, mean, I know Michaela pretty well, she autographed a copy of her book, but her arguments were most eloquent because her arguments were largely, if the Kalenjin did very well under Arab Moy, and if your dad and Amwai Kibaki and other people who are, if they've done well, well, it was almost natural that the man contesting for election against you would say, it is our own turn to eat, and we can see what power has been. Therefore, it is our turn to continue with the things of, that other people have done, privilege their community, privilege their... So if we cannot grow a country like this. We will remain volatile. And as you see in the, on a racetrack, everybody stands or kneels differently. There is no advantage. The location may be different. But when the gun is fired, the man who is right in the... In, closer to the inner part of the, of the ring, is a little bit away. We don't expect that all of us will finish, but let us create an environment in which all of us can compete. 
and we will win, win according to our energy and our speed. I used to have a parishioner, and she came to me and she was complaining. You know, when, when they were, that is the local school examination, when they are over, most people will come to you and they say, my son passed Wayek. But if they don't pass, they say, Wayek failed my son. <laughs> so the challenge for us in Nigeria is to create a condition, a situation where all of us can compete. We will never win the same prize. But let there be, as, the, as His Eminence the Sultan said, let loss of elections not be a punitive, because the problem with Africa, when you lose the elections, you don't get a chance to get back in. When you lose the elections, you can tell, you can lose your life. But you all, it also means that there will be no road to your village, that there will be no water, and African politics must remain and will remain violent. Unless and until we find an equilibrium in which, one, we are citizens of a country. My constitution allows me the right to stop being a Catholic or to stop being a Christian today. His eminence always jokes with me. He says, he says to me, you know, they sent you to Sokoto so that we can convert you and make you a Muslim. And the constitution allows that. But I also let him know that I'm looking forward to the day that I will also either baptize him. And, but we can talk about that. But the challenge for those, and I want, to, I want to end. I want to end by saying, right now, 133 million Nigerians are suffering from various levels of multidimensional poverty. Okay? I have not turned the light and seen a part where Muslims are living that they have light. I've not seen a part of the country where Muslims are eating and the rest of us are not eating. So we must come to terms with the fact that we are not bleeding, we are not suffering because we are Christians or Muslims, but we are in a country that is malfunctioning. How to make that country work for the rich, for the poor, for the aged, and for everybody is a challenge. It's not a challenge that everybody can win, but I think it's a challenge that a government that appreciates, it doesn't have all the answers must come to terms with the fact that there is a way of looking for and finding answers. I would like to just end by saying, and I make the point very clearly, it is in the struggle with the problems of Nigeria. I remain exceptionally optimistic. I travel the world. People say to me after, where do you find this courage to say that Nigeria is working? When you say, okay, it may not be working, but this is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not being flippant. When I went to the United States of America to study, I preached in a church. The, the parish priest called me and said, listen, you know, you speak with such eloquence. I like you. We'll get you a green card. You know, you can settle here in America. And I looked at him. I said, you know, this God is a wonderful God. You are giving me a green card. My passport is actually a green passport. So what am I doing with a green card? So the young Nigerians who are living in our country, I always say to them, no, I'm not worried. Really, I'm not worried. Let them go. It's for the good of the country. The challenge for us as Africans is to think the way the Asians have thought. That is, you go to Europe, you go to America with a purpose. But that purpose means coming back to develop your country. But it also means that that country must create an environment in which you can feel confident to come and present the gifts that God has given you. You know, I have two, two young men. They're in America. They just finished from, from a prestigious university. I said, when are you coming home? They say, Bishop, coming home to do what? I said, no, coming home to... He said, we don't have an uncle who is a senator. We don't have anybody in government. What are we coming to Nigeria to do? So, Mr. President, I mean, Vice President, elect the challenge for you is to make this country believable, livable, credible, so that all of us together can stand in one tent and build a great nation. Once again, Secretary to Government, I want to thank you and thank the organizers for inviting me. God bless you and God bless our country.